And uh, yes, I confirm that I am Conrad Garbat. I am an MD. Uh, I was trained in psychiatry uh, at the University of Basel and the University of Psychiatry Clinics of Basel, where I also did a PhD at the Center for Chronobiology. So in that occasion, I met uh, Manuel, of course, who spent some time there. And we are also colleagues on an international platform uh, on daylight research. So I'm really glad that you have invited me to join this talk series uh, today. And uh, yeah, I think we can make a start. The topic of my talk is, as you can see here, sleep and circadian health in the perinatal periods. I uh, spent some time indeed and put some efforts in the last few years studying a large population of uh, women during the perinatal period, uh, focusing on the sleep and mood disorder in this population. And so we'll give you some insights into uh, the results of uh, uh, the study that we have conducted in collaboration with uh, many centers or some centers at least in Italy and one in Switzerland. I have no conflict of interest to disclose for this presentation. And just to give you an overlook uh, of the uh, topics that will be covered today, we'll start with an introduction on sleep and mood disorders during the perinatal period. I'll show you the results of a systematic review and meta-analysis that we have conducted on polysomnography during pregnancy. And then I will uh, go to uh, the uh, rational and findings of a large multicenter study, as mentioned before, called LIFON, which was in collaboration with some Italian centers and what was focused on perinatal depression. I'll talk about the chronotype and perinatal depression, so something more circadian related, something more sleep related, uh, um, will be shown to me as a, as a polysomnographic results. And then I'll close with some results uh, regarding bright light therapy for treating and also for preventing perinatal depression. So as you have uh, probably already well, uh, well understood, the main topic here is PND, perinatal depression. And this is a particularly relevant topic for everyone who is active in, uh, and working in mental health. Um, uh, first of all, the definition of perinatal depression is nowadays the uh, more current definition from the DSM-5, which puts together a bit previous definitions of antenatal and postnatal or postpartum depression. So we are not talking about the pre and postpartum depression anymore. We are talking about a depressive episode, which is actually very similar to a, a major depressive episode, but with a particular time frame of onset during pregnancy or up to four weeks after delivery. This is the current and more uh, actual definition of uh, PND. Why is it so important for mental health researchers and providers? Because the prevalence of PND is so high, it affects 10 to 15% of women worldwide. And it's even more prevalent during the postpartum period, as you can see here, as compared to the prepartum period. It is considered the most common complication of the perinatal period. For example, everyone knows about gestational diabetes as one of the most frequent complications in the perinatal period, but PND is even more complication. And that's why it really requires some attention by clinicians and also by researchers in this field. And it has also been considered the leading cause of disease burden in women of childbearing age, according to the WHO. Of note, there are so many unfavorable and negative consequences of, un of an untreated PND that this also uh, means that we really have to pay much attention to this problem in terms of public health, because as you can see here, an untreated PND can lead. Uh, unfortunately, to preterm delivery and low birth weight, to behavior and psychological distress in children, and to a series of other negative outcomes, among which also abusive behavior toward children and even suicide of mother. 
As regards the pathophysiology or the pathogenetic hypothesis of PND, hormonal factors are certainly playing a, a big role. We know that there are so many changes in labeling gonadal steroids during pregnancy and the postpartum, and that most of these changes really have an interaction with many neurotransmitters in our brain and also are implicated in a dysregulation of the HPA axis. But of course, uh, if we talk about causes uh, of uh, PND, psychosocial factors are also important, like a lack of social support or domestic violence. And one of the most important predictors of PND is having had a previous depressive episode in this, in this women, genetic vulnerability, but also sleep and circadian rhythm disruption seems to, may, to play a major role. And this, this is the, the one of the factors we we're really focusing on by doing our research study. Why is that? Well, just thinking about the hormonal changes that I was mentioning before, basically every hormone uh, in, uh, implicated in, uh, during pregnancy in the postpartum also affects sleep in some ways. You can see here, the estro estrogens tend to reduce REM sleep and sleep duration. Progesterone increases fatigue, daytime sleepiness, body temperature, and leads to respiratory alkalosis and hypocapnia, so sleep disorder of breathing. Prolactin increases low-wave sleep. HCG uh, increases daytime sleepiness, and oxytocin uh, can lead to nocturnal ut uterine contractions and so also to sleep fragmentation. For this reason, there has been some uh, comprehensive pathogenetic hypothesis about how perinatal depression and other negative consequences of pregnancy are uh, determined. And one of the hypotheses is that in women who are probably somehow already predisposed to high level of stress, pregnancy per se can represent an, a, a precipitating stress factor which adds to previous stress. And this can uh, ultimately lead to uh, less sleep, to a chronic sleep loss. And chronic sleep loss uh, during um, long term can of course lead to a series of negative consequences for our organism, uh, including an, in an increase in inflammatory markers, an increase in inflammation, an increase probably in neuroinflammation, in HPA activity. And so in this way, we have in the, in the, in the last end, uh, a series of uh, adverse pregnancy outcomes, among them also perinatal depression. But how these sleep disorders in particular um, during pregnancy are reported by perinatal women? Well, there was here in 2007, a big telephone survey in uh, America asking uh, pregnant women, how do they sleep? As you can see here, 30% of them reported that they rarely or never get, got a good night's sleep. 84% experienced a sleep problem a few nights a week and 40% reported symptoms of a sleep disorders, in particular sleep breathing disorders of restless leg syndrome. These were the main causes of sleep disturbances during pregnancy, and all of them are basically increasing from the second to the third trimester of pregnancy. If you consider uh, the uh, need to go to the bathroom or back pain or intense streaming, and nasal congestion and so on. So they are all increasing across uh, uh, pregnancy. So some also were obviously interested also in uh, um, uh, systematically review all the studies that have considered sleep quality during pregnancy. And this is an example of a comprehensive systematic uh, review made by um, some people who were particularly interesting in seeing how the PSQI, so the classical Pittsburgh Sleep Quality Index, which has a cutoff of five, so greater or major of five, in many, many studies, so pulling together more than 11 participants, 
changes during pregnancy. And they saw that uh, indeed the PSQI average score is a bit over the cutoff and 45% of women so experience poor sleep quality during pregnancy with a decrease of sleep quality, as mentioned before, in particular from the third, second to the third trimester, and with gestational age moderating the average score and the prevalence of a PSQI above the cutoff score of five. So they concluded that sleep quality is reduced for many pregnant women, but it's actually mildly reduced. So the, 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 the average score, as I said, is a six. So it's just above the cutoff of five, which means that it's important to differentiate what are the normative mild disturbances from more severe sleep disturbances, like having a real sleep apnea during pregnancy, having, having a restless leg syndrome or other sleep disorders. And they also question if the cutoff of five, which we normally apply for insomnia, for example, or other sleep disorders, may be actually the right one in the pregnant women population, especially if we talk about uh, if we talk about the third trimester. Another systematic review and meta-analysis here considers something different, uh, which is the relationship and the association between sleep disturbances in general. So not only taking a questionnaire like a PSQI, but looking at pregnant women who had a diagnosis of a sleep disorders. And for sleep disorders, they considered here, for example, restless leg syndrome, OSA, subjective sleep disorder breathing, poor sleep quality, insomnia, and they look at the association with a, a series of uh, uh, negative outcomes during, uh, so for mothers and also for the fetus. And I found indeed a significant as association of this group of sleep disorders taken together with, for example, preeclampsia, gestational hypertension, gestational diabetes, mellicin and cesarean section in the mothers, and even with preterm birth in the fetus, these are the significant values shown there. So um, considering the real sleep disorder, so we made so far difference between what is subjective sleep quality as measured by PSQI and what is an objective sleep disorders that some women can develop during pregnancy. If we think about sleep disorders, the first question that comes to the mind of a sleep physician like me, for example, is, what is actually telling PSG, so polysomnography, which is the gold standard tool to measure sleep and to diagnose sleep disorders about pregnancy. If you apply polysomnography, that as you can, as you know very well, is a quite technically complex tool uh, with which you can really record a series of parameters during sleep growing from EEG to EMG, leg movements, um, uh, breathing disorders, and so on. So the question here was, why don't we uh, try to do as another systematic review and possibly a meta-analysis, but not, not looking at a sleep questionnaire and not looking at subjective sleep disorders, but looking at what PSG findings are telling us about how sleep is disturbed during pregnancy. And her hypothesis was that subjective sleep disturbances that are so common as we have seen during pregnancy may indeed correspond to objective alteration in sleep architecture that can only be detected by PSG. And so with this hypothesis in mind, we went and performed a first systematic review and meta-analysis, which was not present in the literature so far of PSG studies during pregnancy in order to identify some possible markers of sleep disruption that can be highlighted only with a specific advance tool like PSG. And these are uh, bit the, the results of this meta-analysis that we've published two, days, uh, two years ago and a sleep medicine uh, reviews following the classical uh, PRISMA guidelines that you know all very well. 
What we find uh, as results of the systematic review is that indeed objective changes in sleep macrostructure, in particular in the third trimester, are very well detected if you use PSG, so an objective instrument and tool like PSG. And what you can see if you go and record people during sleep in the third trimester, especially, is that they have a short sleep duration. So women sleep less during the third trimester when they're pregnant. They have a more fragmented sleep, so they have more awakenings. They have an increase in non-REM sleep stages N1 and N2 that, as you, can, as you know very well, are, are, the most, are the more superficial sleep stages. So reduction of slow wave sleep and increase in superficial sleep stages, and even a reduction in REM sleep. But what we, what we also found by reviewing the literature is that actually is not pregnancy per se an independent risk factor for developing major PSG assessed sleep disorders. So if women during pregnancy are otherwise healthy women, they will not develop a major sleep disorders as can be diagnosed using the international classification of sleep disorder. Okay, so they will have some physiological modi modification and alteration in the sleep pattern that are listed here, but they, they will not uh, being affected by a diagnosed sleep disorders. Okay, in particular, what we have seen is that the respiratory pattern is deteriorated, is altering the third trimester of, um, of gestation. And this is a common finding in women who are already at risk. And at risk women are identified by women who have an A and higher AHI, which as you know, is a respiratory index indicating uh, the amount of sleep apnea per hours of sleep, ODI, another respiratory index, snoring time, and incidence of OSA. Of OSA. So in conclusion, in women, in pregnant women with predisposing factors, so women who have obesity, who have a larger neck circumference, who have a higher maternal age at pregnancy onset, who have hypertension, preeclampsia, all these factors contribute to uh, being affected by OSA and sleep apnea, uh, for instance, during pregnancy. But for all other women who are otherwise healthy, the risk of developing as real sleep disorders, so a diagnosed sleep disorders is actually low. And this is because pregnancy is in a, ultimately a physiological condition, not a pathological condition. When we went and also uh, did a quantitative analysis, so not only a qualitative analysis, but a quantitative analysis, also called a meta-analysis of the same studies we found that as compared, uh, so comparing the third trimester of pregnancy with the third trimester, so first and third, there was a significant reduction in at least two parameters. The total sleep time, total sleep time were, was reduced by 26 minutes. And this, this was statistically significant. And sleep efficiency was reduced by about 4%, also significant. Uh, again, taking into consideration the difference between first and third trimester. So even if you go and analyze the studies in a quantitative way, you see, for instance, a reduction in total sleep time and sleep efficiency across pregnancy. So the summary of the systematic review was that a full PSG assessment may be required to uh, assess and diagnose sleep disorders, of course, during pregnancy, and to avoid the risk of under or overestimation of self-reported sleep problems, okay? And um, uh, the other conclusion was that the, that the classical PSG parameters for the diagnosis of OSA in the population that is not pregnant are probably just normal or slightly increased in women that are otherwise healthy women. So what we have to ask ourselves when we go and do a PSG study in pregnant women is, 
what are actually the normative values for sleep disorder breathing in each trimester of gestations and maybe try to find it out in larger data sets and pay attention and at some specific alteration in the respiratory patterns that are more in terms of airflow limitation and snoring that may be more reliable in identifying conditions that are at the borderline between normality and pathology as regard to pregnant women. So we will not find evidence of major or say of major sleep apnea in this population, but we can, can still pay attention to air, airflow limitations, snoring, and see if these are related actually to the negative consequences of pregnancy that I was mentioning before. So after um, doing this literature review, or actually uh, simultaneously, we were uh, conducting a study in pregnant women called the LIFON project, which involved four centers. One was Lugano, where I was working at that time. The other three centers were Turin and Milan and Bologna in Italy. So putting together these four centers, we really aimed at uh, having a population and a large cohort of women during uh, pregnancy and the postpartum to be studied and to be investigated regarding the relationship between sleep and sleep disorders and mood disorders at the same time. And this was the study design of the life form, quite complicated. As you can see here, there was a central part of the study with pregnant women uh, included in the study in the early pregnancy, it's the first trimester of pregnancy, and then follow up across pregnancy, but also during the postpartum until one year postpartum, so after delivery. So there was a follow up of 18 months, it's a very long, very demanding study for these women, also for the investigators, of course. Uh, with three uh, visits during pregnancy and some other visits during the postpartum period. Okay, and between, between the third and the fourth visit, there was the delivery term for every uh, participant. Um, so in parallel, we also gave the opportunity to those women who developed uh, perinatal depression, so depressive episodes during pregnancy or postpartum, to enter an RCT with light therapy versus uh, placebo light for treating perinatal depression. And I will show you the results of this trial. And the, the another sub-study was um, giving light, so exposing women to light and to light therapy, to light boxes, even if they didn't have any form of depression, just to verify and to test if light exposure during pregnancy can be protective in some way and can prevent in some way the onset of perinatal depression, especially in the postpartum. So light given during pregnancy may protect these women to developing a perinatal depression postpartum. This was at least our hypothesis or our main question. And this is just the schedule of study visits in the life on study. As you've seen, women were repeatedly assessed during 11 visits from early pregnancy until one year postpartum. And there was a comprehensive evaluation of many, many parameters from demographic to gynecologic. We assessed depression, of course, using several tools, several instruments. We assessed sleep. We uh, did actigraphy three times, which is interesting, I think. So one time during post, during pregnancy, but also one time at three months postpartum and one time at one year postpartum. And we'll see how the trend is uh, in uh, actigraph, actigraphic pattern or rest activity patterns at these um, three time points. And we also did PSG, so the huge polysomnography tool with all the cables and the electrodes just one time during uh, the second trimester of gestation. And we also collected blood repeatedly from this participant. So we have now a biobank actually full of blood samples for further analysis that still have to be done.
So I'm going to show you uh, first the results uh, of, uh, of this um, of the life and study in terms of social demographic uh, parameters that we have collected from this population. We had at the end of the study 439 uh, pregnant women recruited, so a large population, as I said, with a mean age of 33.7 33 uh, years. And um, so generally, these women were recruited in three large cities in Italy and one city in Lugano. And it can be said that they were all women with a very stable and high socioeconomic status, as you can see from these parameters. Most of them married, most of them having a permanent working position, most of them having a higher education level and especially most of them being not overweight and not even obese. This is the mean BMI in every visit. And as you can see, the, the, the pathological cutoff uh, starts to be at 25 between normality and overweight. There was just in the third trimester of pregnancy, the mean BMI was just a little bit above 25, but in general we had um, a population of women with no obesity and no overweight. And we will see how this affected the results of the study, of course. Then, as I mentioned before, we did polysomnography. So we performed a PSG for at least a part of those women who, uh, those who accepted to uh, receive polysomnography, who were 353. And this is really to date the largest set data set of PSG that we have available, I think, uh, so far. Uh, at least in, in didn't find by reviewing the literature any, any larger study using PSG than this one. And with, uh, what we found was that the distribution of the sleep stages was absolutely normal actually. So the sleep macrostructure was absolutely normal. But um, looking at the PSG variables, we found an increase in awakenings, an increase in arousal index, and in time spent awake after sleep onset, and a decrease in total sleep time. 24% of women had a total sleep time less than six hours, which is not much. And 30.6% of women had a sleep efficiency um, below 80%, which is obviously much sometimes low, I would say. But interesting, looking at the uh, sleep disorder breathing parameter, for example, they were all uh, mostly in the range of normality. So basically no severe or moderate sleep apnea found in this population. What we found were some obstructive hypopneas, some respiratory effort related arousal rares, but all the indexes that are normally used to diagnose OSA were, let's say, in the range of normality or quite low. When we look at sleep quality and insomnia, so taking the PSQI, we found this very nice trend in PSQI increasing from the third trimester to the third trimester of pregnancy. This is the time of delivery. And as you see, just after delivery, so the very first weeks after delivery, there is a spike in the PSQI, which then normalizes again. And a little bit the same trend has also the ICI, so the insomnia uh, severity index. Regarding daytime sleepiness, we found a decrease of daytime sleepiness from the first trimester across the study. So daytime sleepiness is also probably due to hormonal factors higher in the third trimester of pregnancy as compared to the uh, other time points during the study. And there was a positive correlation between daytime sleepiness with insomnia and sleep quality as shown here. And the most evident finding was uh, a quite, uh, so um, I would say moderate to high uh, incidence year of uh, restless prevalence year of restless legs during pregnancy, which was 27%, so in line with the literature. And also 45% of women had periodic leg movements during sleep, so were kicking their legs during sleep 
uh, quite a lot, especially during pregnancy, with again a drop in these results after delivery, which is perfectly in line with what we know about restless leg during pregnancy. So increasing from the first to the third trimester and then decreasing postpartum. So the summary of the polysomnographic data that we have collected in our study was that um, insomnia, sleepiness, and restless legs are highly frequent during pregnancy. These are not polysomnographic data necessarily, but this was certainly also a finding. Sleep macrostructures was mildly affected by pregnancy. In particular, sleep disorder breathing was infrequent, so not common, but restless legs and PLMS were very frequent, with in particular a peak in the third trimester of gestation. Moving to another topic, uh, I, talk, I talked a lot about sleep and sleep features and characteristics in this population. I would like to go now to the more circadian part of the study and talk a bit about chronotype. We all know what chronotype is. This is a definition from Ronneberg, of course. The individual chronotype is individual self-selected time of sleep in relation to local time. It has a quite normal distribution in the general population with different chronotypes being differentiated here from early type to normal and late type. And what we know about the evening chronotypes that are, that are also always on the, on the spotlight, let's say, evening chronotypes in the general population have a higher incidence of poor sleep quality, of increased daytime sleepiness, of depression and suicide, of less healthy dietary habits, including a more a higher consume of alcohol, nicotine, and caffeine. And they are also more likely to suffer from hypertension, type 2 diabetes, and bronchial, bronchial asthma. Uh, as regards the pregnant evening chronotypes, and particularly the pregnant women with evening chronotype, there are some studies showing that they have a greater seasonal variation in mood and behaviors, a higher prevalence of insomnia and depression, and they also have more symptoms of mania and OCD. So our research question here was, uh, what is the correlation of chronotype with, for example, perinatal depression in our study? And the hypothesis was that even in chronotype it may be predictive of perinatal depression of occurrence and symptom severity, and that pregnant evening chronotypes may present unfavorable social conditions and lifestyle, lifestyle attitudes that predispose them to develop PND. For doing this analysis, which is now published in a journal of affective disorders, we take a single measurement of chronotype using the MEQ, the morning and evening, evening desk questionnaires during the first trimester of gestation. And first of all, we found that, that the distribution of chronotypes in our population was actually quite normal in 299 women. We just had a little bit more morning chronotypes compared to evening chronotypes. This was something, something I think particular in our population. But more interestingly, when we start in doing some uh, data analysis and some statistics, we really find a group effect of chronotype on smoking behavior. So I was mentioning from the literature uh, before, there is an association between evening chronotypes and, uh, and smoking or alcohol abuse behavior. Uh, and at least a significant group effect of chronotype on smoking behavior was found here. And there were also some smaller group effects of chronotype on several other variables like the type of delivery, having gestational diabetes, mellitus, consuming alcohol, having a past alcohol consumption or medication in, with intake, which were not statistically significant looking at the p-values, but looking at the group effects, there were some uh, small group effects in this case. Even considering the APDS values over time, APDS is the most used, widely used tool to screen for perinatal depression. It's called Edinburgh Postnatal Depression Scale. You see here on the left, the row 
values of the APDS across the study with a slight increase uh, uh, during the visit four and visit five, which are right after delivery, so in the immediate postpartum period. And as you can see here, this effect of EPDS increase in the, in the immediate postpartum is really partly mediated by the chronotype group. So again, a group effect here of chronotype with in particular evening chronotype that seems to have a higher, high, higher values of the EPDS. And we even, we even did a, here a model fit based on backward elimination and a KIK information criteria. And we found that indeed uh, chronotype and in particular evening chronotype tend to have uh, higher APDS values over time. Okay, to lesser extent also intermediate chronotype, but this effect was more evident uh, for evening chronotype, depending on time. So, so this is a significant time chronotype interaction that was highlighted here. Looking at the uh, cumulative incidence uh, of perinatal depression, as you can see here with the classical Kaplan-Meier curve, there was an increase in the perinatal depression in the incidence around delivery. Here is delivery, and here is the clear increase in PND incidence in every uh, chronotype, let's say morning, intermediate, and evening, but it was really more pronounced in the evening group again, even if this was not statistically significant. So the summary here was that pregnant women with evening chronotype have, first of all, social demographic characteristics like smoking or alcohol consumption that are more commonly associated with a higher risk of PND. They are more likely subject to health problems like diabetes or like to having cesarean delivery. And that evening prototype is significantly associated with more severe PND symptoms depending on time. So specifically in the immediate postpartum period, which led us to conclude that we can, we can if we can just uh, administer a chronotype questionnaire like the NEQ or the MCTQ, to a pregnant woman during their routine gynecological visit, we may probably identif identify some women who may have a higher risk of having PND, which is, I think, a quite interesting finding. And coming here to the last part of the talk, which regards uh, light therapy, um, I guess I don't have to talk uh, much about light therapy in general. And this is just a slide that, I've, uh, uh, that I have from uh, Anavis Justice, which summarizes a bit uh, more than 30 years or 40 years of research on light therapy for treating SAD, winter depression, but also non seasonal depression, bipolar depression, as well as circadian rhythm disorder. So light therapy is a very effective tool, a very safe tool for treating mood disorders, particular depression in every form, and also for treating circadian rhythm disease. I'd like to focus on bright light therapy for treating perinatal depression. And there are, uh, for instance, some rational, some a good reason to use light therapy for this particular form of depression. First of all, light exposure in the peripartum seems to improve mood regulation seems to resynchronize circadian rhythms, to improve serotonergic neurotransmission, also to modulate some of the estrogen levels and to alleviate, of course, PND associated fatigue and sleep disturbances. So the sleep and uh, disturbances that, that are associated and correlated with perinatal depression. For this reason, bright light therapy for treating perinatal depression was always used and tested in a few studies, just a few studies, with overall very good results, uh, results that show a very good uh, safety profile and acceptance and compliance by um, women uh, receiving bright light therapy for perinatal depression. Now, probably the larger study that was done before we started our study was the one by Annabelle Justice herself at the Center for Chronobiology in Basel, 
uh, of which I summarized the results here again, um, uh, where she found in a quite small population of women, 27 women in this case, very uh, significant um, uh, higher response rate, so significantly higher response rate and even remission rate in women who uh, were exposed to bright light as compared to placebo, um, placebo dim light. Okay. So in the case of the LIFON study, of our study, we also wanted to test, of course, bright light therapy. And not only during antenatal depression, I missed to say that Anna was testing bright light therapy in the antepartum depression because there was no definition of perinatal depression at that time. So we, we, we had the idea to test bright light therapy in perinatal depression. So according to the new, new definition, no difference between pregnancy and postpartum. All women who just developed a major depressive episode from the first trimester of pregnancy until uh, one year postpartum could enter a randomized control trial here with bright light therapy versus placebo dim light. And this was our RCT. What we have done, we have used uh, Philips lamps uh, of two types, one with bright light at 10,000 lux, another one with placebo dim light at 19 lux, and exposed uh, women with perinatal depression, which was defined as a, having an EPDS score over 12, so Edinburgh postnatal depression scale over 12 was for us the screening instrument used for identifying uh, women with perinatal depression. They were exposed for six weeks for 30 minutes within 20 minutes of getting up at 30, 30 centimeter distance. And we tested side effects and uh, safety uh, using in particular this instrument, this tool, this safety uh, questionnaire. We had also small population, unfortunately, just 11 women in one group, 11 women in another group. But we had amazing results that are published now in Acta Psychiatrica, Scandinavica. As you can see here, there was a very, very clear drop in the raw data of the APDS in the two groups. So the bright light is the blue one, the placebo group is the red one. Just the pre and post exposure to light therapy, there is a drop in the APDS score in the bright light therapy group, but not as much as actually not so much in the placebo group. And then what we also found here is that there was a reduction in the APDS values over time according and stratified for the treatment group. So if you take here in consideration the time of therapy as reference, and if you take the time in the two groups, not as a continuous time, but as a factor, having the therapy time here as a reference, you really see that in the bright light therapy group, the EPDS values are constantly low uh, under the, the pathological score, which is not the case with the placebo uh, group. And then we did an analysis uh, similarly as in Anna via Justice paper, remissions and response rates. As you can see here very well, again, there was an improvement of over 50% in remission to a final APDS score uh, um, under 12, so smaller than 12 which was statistically significant here. So in the end, we could really conclude that morning bright light therapy induced a significant remission from PND as compared to dim red light, irrespective of the time of onset. So this was true for every woman who developed PND during pregnancy, but also during the postpartum. And this effect was maintained across the perinatal period. So one thing that I like of the study, going back to this uh, picture here, is that we had a, such a long follow-up of these women that we could really show that the effect of bright light therapy is not just during therapy or right after that, but is maintained over time. So it is sustained over time, which was, I, I don't think it was shown before by other studies that because they had the shorter uh, follow-up. So this was the 
advantage of having a longer follow-up. Safety profile was uh, very good and uh, light therapy was very well tolerated by perinatal uh, women. Of course, the population studies was uh, again uh, a bit small and we need larger RCTs with longer observation period to see uh, the short and long-term effects of BLT for perinatal mood disorders. And we need, of course, further research also to investigate and to understand how does actually bright light therapy work in perinatal depression women specifically. Now I would like to conclude here uh, just showing you uh, some a few data that are not published yet, but regard the uh, third uh, sub-study, the life on three. As I mentioned at the beginning, these were women not depressed, so with no evidence of depression, EPDS score below 12, who were exposed during the second trimester of pregnancy to bright light therapy, no control group. To, to, so this was an open label study, an open study, pilot study, as you want to call it. Uh, and this was just with the aim to see if they would have, uh, they would be more protected from uh, an occurrence of perinatal depression in the postpartum. And this was not the case. So unfortunately, these are, these are negative results. Uh, taking into, con into consideration different scales, the APDS, the Hamilton, and the Montgomery scale, we found in every case that uh, uh, in the two groups, so in the bright light group uh, and in the controls, uh, I mean, there was a control group, but there were, it was not exposed to placebo light. It was just a control group made by all other women that were not treated with uh, any form of light. There was no difference in the values of EPDS, Hamilton, or Montgomery scale, okay? And even constructing here um, uh, cumulative incidence curve, uh, just um, basically a very, very few difference, very, very slight difference between uh, the two groups, uh, but uh, statistically not significant. I think I, I talked a lot. I talked uh, almost 50 minutes. So I need to stop here also to give the opportunity to ask some question. I hope uh, that the results of the life on study were of interest for the audience. And I thank you, uh, well, I thank, uh, of course, all the collaborators on the study and uh, every one of you for your attention.